Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kato Boyle, convener of the Otago Women Lawyers Society, or OWLS as we're more commonly known. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to the 19th annual New Zealand Law Foundation Ethel Benjamin Commemorative Address. In particular, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our previous speakers, Justice Ellen France and Justice Helen Wynne Kalman, members of the Judiciary, Queen's Council, members of Parliament and councillors, members of the profession, the law faculty, the New Zealand Law Foundation and New Zealand Law Society, ladies and gentlemen. This address honours the life and career of Ethel Benjamin, the first woman to be admitted to the bar in New Zealand and the first woman um, in the British Empire to appear as counsel in court. Over the past 19 years, OWLS, with the generous support of the New Zealand Law Foundation, has invited outstanding women in of the law to deliver the address. The primary objectives of the address are to honour and preserve the pioneering spirit possessed by Ethel Benjamin, to encourage education and achievement in the woman of today, and to stimulate debate about issues affecting social justice and gender. While the specific issues facing Ethel may lo no longer hinder uh, modern day graduates of the law, issues of social justice and equality are still topical and it is forums like this that we have the opportunity to encourage debate and shine light upon those issues. Uh, the address has been presented by our, the highest calibre of speakers, and today is no exception to that. A speaker today, like those of the past, is a woman who has a most impressive legal career and embodies a spirit that Ethel Benjamin would be proud of. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Her Honour Justice Christine French, um, as this year's speaker. Justice French was educated in Invercargill and achieved a Bachelor of Law degrees with honours from the University of Otago in 1981. She went on to be awarded a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford and obtained a Bachelor of Civil Law in 1983. On returning to New Zealand, her honour practised at French Burt Partners of Invercargill and became a partner within five years. Um, Justice French specialised in civil litigation and employment law she was also an active member of a num on a number of law society committees um, and is a past trustee of the New Zealand Law Foundation. On 1 March 2008, Justice French was appointed to the High Court of New Zealand and then elevated to the Court of Appeal on the 6th of August 2012. Justice French has had a most impressive legal career uh, both at the bar and at the bench and is held in the highest regard uh, by the wider legal profession. Uh, this is evidenced by Justice French being awarded an honorary doctorate of law from Otago University in 2014. Um, and this was followed by the Southland branch of the New Zealand Law Society launching the inaugural Justice Christine French commemorative address last year. During her time to uh, well, sorry, <laughs> during her time on the bench, Justice French uh, was part of a momentous occasion. Um, earlier this year, on the 5th of August, the first ever all-woman Court of Appeal bench sat. Only a mere 153 years <laughs> <laughs> since the court came into existence. Um, the judges sitting were Justice French, um, Justice Ellen France and Justice Wynne Kalman. All outstanding women of the law, all of whom have given this address and all of whom are in this very room today. <laughs> On that note, Justice French has prepared an engaging and topical address, and I will hand over to her now. Well, as Malcolm Muggeridge supposedly once said, after an introduction like that, I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kate, for those excessively kind comments and the warmth of your welcome so typical of the extraordinary uh, support and generosity that has been shown me in the, in the Deep South and for which I'm very grateful. It is, in fact, the envy of my colleagues. Uh, only the other day, Justice Cooper was talking about it and asked if I thought he should let it be known that he was born in Invercargill. <laughs> Notwithstanding the kind comments, I do honestly um, feel quite unworthy 
uh, compared with the remarkable woman whose memory we honour today, Ethel Benjamin. Unlike Ethel and other trailblazers, I've had a, an easy run um, in my career, encountering very little direct discrimination. Uh, Kate, being made partner within five years is hardly an achievement when the senior partners are one's father and brothers. <laughs> uh, most people would say that I spent too much time in the District Law Society Library and I attended every uh, single bar dinner. Uh, we are talking Southland bar dinners after all. <laughs> Yes, I have had an easy run, and of course that is due in very large measure uh, to the real uh, trailblazers. I often wonder what Ethel would make of it all, actually, her iconic status, a prestigious scholarship and a street named after her, as well as this annual event. She might be surprised, but um, proud, and rightly so, the first woman to graduate with a law degree in New Zealand, the first to be admitted to the bar, and in the same year, 1897, aged only 22, the first woman in the entire British Empire uh, to appear in court as counsel, setting up practice on her own account. What, what courage and strength of character it must have taken uh, to overcome all the obstacles that must have stood in the path of those achievements. And here she is at the opening of the court in 1902. I think that what stands out for me is that Ethel defies all the stereotypes. She was scholarly and a feminist. She talked about the legal profession providing, and I quote, a noble opportunity for service by women whose hearts are touched by the weak and helpless. And she was true to that. She was the solicitor for the Society for the Protection of Women and Children and acted in many cases on behalf of abused and destitute women. But she also acted for the liquor industry, owned and managed hotels herself, dabbled in property speculation, and later in England ran a bank. Just to show how far ahead of her time Ethel was, the Southland District Law Society did not have any female members until the 1970s. And for the mathematicians among you, that was not me. <laughs> Acutely conscious of the importance of this occasion, I agonised over the choice of topic. In Ethel's graduation speech, she said, I knew little would be expected of me, and even if I succeeded in talking nonsense, the charitable verdict would be, oh well, it's all that can be expected of a woman. In 2015, perhaps fortunately I don't have that comfort. <laughs> Finally, after seeking wise counsel from Professor Hennigan, I decided to talk about the role of the judge in sentencing. As Mark pointed out to me, sentencing is the most publicly visible part of a judge's role. It is the function most people think about when they think of the work of a judge. Mark was tactful enough not to add, and it's the one that attracts the most public criticism. For there is, I believe, a reasonably widespread perception in the community that sentencing judges enjoy too much discretion, are too soft, and pander to criminals at the expense of victims. This is not unique to New Zealand. Opinion polls in Australia and the UK consistently show as many as 70 to 80% of respondents believe that sentences imposed by judges are too lenient. In a speech about the influences of the media, a retired English judge observed any judge who started life in the law as I did as a barrister in the early 1960s, was appointed in the late 1980s and is only recently retired, will have seen the stereotype of the judge transformed in certain organs of the press from that of a port-soaked reactionary 
still secretly resentful of the abolition of the birch and hostile to liberal influences of any kind, to that of an unashamedly progressive member of the chattering classes out of touch with ordinary people. I like that so much, so I borrowed it as the <laughs> subtitle. <laughs> In this address, I trace the oh, gone too far. In this address, I trace the history of sentencing in New Zealand. Ask whether and to what extent sentences should be responsive to public opinion. Whether sentencing judges do have an image problem, and if so, what if anything can or should be done about it. Sentencing is undoubtedly one of the most difficult and challenging aspects of the job, if not the most. Justice McArdle once said, trying a case is as easy as falling off a log. The difficulty comes in knowing what to do with an accused once they've been found guilty. My very first murder sentencing as a judge, the Crown thought the non-parole period should be 10 years, the judge thought 17, and the defendant wanted capital punishment. <laughs> Most people agree that ideally the punishment should fit the crime and the circumstances of the offender, but putting that into practice is not so easy. I think sentencing is inherently challenging for two reasons. First, because it can be so emotionally charged. The facts are often harrowing, involving sadly as they so often do, stories of brutality or depraved behaviour, misery, suffering and hopelessness. Second, challenging, because it requires the judge to reconcile the seemingly irreconcilable. As has been uh, said, sentencing is founded upon two premises that are in perennial conflict, individualised justice and consistency. The first holds that court should impose sentences that are just and appropriate according to all the circumstances of each particular case. The second holds that similarly situated offenders should receive similar sentencing outcomes. The result is an ambivalent jurisprudence that challenges sentences as they attempt to meet the conflicting demands of each premise. There is tension between consistency and individualised justice. Tension between the purposes of sentencing, between, for example, general deterrence and rehabilitation. Tension where a factor may be both aggravating and mitigating. An offender may have a mental health issue, for example, that makes the offending less blameworthy, but it may be that very same mental health issue that makes them more of a risk uh, to public safety. <coughs> At the time, Ethel Benjamin was practising uh, law in Dunedin. The Criminal Code Act 1983 was in force. Offences were defined in very specific ways. There were, for example, as many as 34 different offences of forgery with various maximum penalties. These maximum penalties were not mandatory, but because everything was so specific, they must have come pretty close to being so. And, of course, there was one notable truly mandatory penalty, the death penalty. Once a person was convicted of murder, the judge had no choice but to impose death. There were a total of 85 executions in New Zealand, the first in 1842 and the last in 1957. As you will probably know, when pronouncing the death sentence, judges used to wear a black cap, and the Christchurch High Court still has one in its basement. It, it belonged to the Chief Justice Myers, who was Chief Justice from 1929 to 1946. I actually had a look at the cap, and underneath there's a label, and it was made by a firm in Chancery Lane. Seems an extraordinary uh, product to be specialising in, but there you go. Seeing a, a black cap tends to send shivers down the spine, but as Lord Phillips has mused extrajudicially, the reaction of people in a hundred years' time to the punishments we impose today may also be one of shock. <laughs>
As a, a gentler further aside, a quick snapshot of sentencing in Dunedin in July 1902 when Ethel was still actively practicing shows that by far the most common offence was drunkenness <laughs> for which the usual penalty was conviction and discharge for a repeat offender, a fine of five shillings. An offence called associating with thieves also um, seems to have been... We're going backwards now. That's no good. We need to get to those nice pictures. That's it. Yes, a, another an offence called associating with thieves um, also seems to have been prevalent in Dunedin. It's not clear from the reports whether the thieves that one was associating with came from the north or the south. <laughs> As the 20th century progressed, there was a movement away from multiple specific offences to broadly defined offences that carried a single but relatively high maximum penalty, which provided little guidance in day-to-day -day sentencing. And so, as one commentator puts it, as a result of the way in which offences were defined, lawmakers handed over the reins of the detail of sentencing policy to the courts. The emphasis came to be very much on the individual judge's discretion so much so that sentences were seldom overturned on appeal. And in a 1950 decision, the Court of Appeal actually rebuked counsel for bringing other cases to its attention, observing that the court did not consider much assistance could be gained from a comparison of sentences. Facts vary so much in all cases that it's only by looking at the particular circumstances of the particular case that a true appreciation of the degree of seriousness of the case is obtained. It is on this appreciation that the sentence should be based. To modern ears, that just sounds like indefensible heresy. We take it as a given that like cases should be treated in like manner and that outcomes should turn as little as possible on the identity of the judge. It was not until the 1970s that following English um, approach, our Court of Appeal started to pay less deference to the views of the sentencing judge and to exercise greater control over sentencing in the interests of consistency. Commencing in 1978 and continuing on into the 80s, it issued a series of tariff judgments detailing ranges of sentences for various offences. If the Court of Appeal was becoming more active, legislative intervention remained relatively limited and so the judges were left essentially to their own devices. All of that was to change in the next decade, principally because of widespread public concern about crime rates and sentencing practice. This culminated in a citizens initiated referendum in 1999. And you may recall, those of you who are old enough, the question asked was, should there be a reform of our justice system, placing greater emphasis on the needs of victims, providing restitution and compensation for them, and imposing minimum sentences and hard labour for all serious violent offences? 91.75% voted yes. I guess if John Key gets as high as that on his flag, he'll be pretty pleased. It's easy to downplay the significance of this result because of the mangled wording and the fact it contains multiple propositions. So you, you can't be certain that the 95% were actually all affirming the same thing. But I personally believe that's a mistake. I think it is fair to say, rightly or wrongly, that the referendum revealed a high level of dissatisfaction in the community with sentencing practice and to that extent a failure on the part of the authorities, including the judiciary, to meet community expectations. One response to this referendum might have been to remove judicial discretion altogether and introduce a mandatory uh, sentencing regime, such as prevails in some parts of the US, where sentences are imposed under a grid system. As I understand it, the judge considers the case by reference to statutorily defined factors, the number and type of factor that generates a numerical sentencing outcome. 
if that was the law in New Zealand, I just wouldn't have accepted appointment. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> even follow it. <laughs> With limited exceptions, such as the three strikes legislation, there has, however, never been strong support in New Zealand for mandatory sentencing. That is principally because of concerns that it can generate grossly disproportionate penalties due to the fact that at the legislative level it's impossible to provide for the infinite variety of circumstances that may arise. The government's response to the referendum was to retain judicial discretion, but make its exercise subject to statutory guidance. And so the Sentencing Act 2002 came into force. That act has been described as the most comprehensive attempt to influence sentencing practice through legislation and as representing a significant change to the traditional approach to sentencing. The act contains a statement of the purposes uh, for which a court may sentence an offender these are expressed at a high level of generality. For example, to hold the offender accountable, to protect the community, to deter others, to assist in the rehabilitation, to provide for the interests of the victim. As well as a statement of the purposes of sentencing, the Act also contains a statement of mandatory principles, such as the principle to impose the least restrictive outcome appropriate. Together with a non-exhaustive list of aggravating and mitigating factors that the sentencer must also take into account. These include the vulnerability of the victim, abuse of trust, premeditation, guilty plea, remorse, previous convictions, and age. In Hessel, the Supreme Court pointed out that the purposes, principles, and factors were not new. They were largely, although not entirely, already recognised by the courts. The significance of the provisions was said by the Supreme Court to lie in the clarity with which they were expressed to the courts and the public. Others have been less charitable. One commentator saying the act is of little practical assistance to sentences because the principles are a statement of the self-evident and the purposes equally weighted, leaving the judge free to select which purpose to adopt according to his or her own pre-existing views of penal philosophy. Professor Hall, who I see is here today, to my consternation, <laughs> <laughs> has expressed the view, in effect, that the Act represents a missed opportunity uh, to develop a coherent sentencing policy. One of the most debated principles in the Act is the principle that the court must take into account the offender's personal, family, whānau, community and cultural background in imposing a sentence or other means of dealing with the offender with a partly or wholly rehabilitative purpose. The existence of this principle has prompted some to advocate that New Zealand judges should follow a Canadian approach to sentencing of Indigenous offenders known as cultural background methodology. Under this approach, sentencing courts are required, they must, recognise that the circumstances of Aboriginal people differ from the broader population because of the history of colonisation. And the judge must take judicial notice of how that history continues to translate into such matters as lower educational attainment, lower incomes, higher unemployment, higher rates of substance abuse, higher rates of incarceration. When sentencing an Indigenous offender, sentences are required to consider these unique systemic or background factors that have played a part in bringing the Indigenous offender before the courts. Under the Canadian approach, it's not necessary for the actual offender to prove a causal link between their cultural heritage and the commission of the index offence. The sentencer must also take into account the types of sentencing procedures and sanctions that may be appropriate for the offender because of his cultural heritage, or her cultural heritage, recognising that not all communities share the same values and that different sanctions may more effectively achieve the objectives of sentencing in a particular community. The Canadian Supreme Court has held that to fail to take those two aspects into account breaches the fundamental principle of sentencing 
that the sentence must be proportionate to the gravity of the offence and the degree of responsibility of the offender. The upshot is that cultural consideration may lead to a different sanction or a reduction in the prison term that would have been imposed for the non-Indigenous offender committing the same offence. <coughs> the argument has already come before a divisional court of the New Zealand Court of Appeal in Mika. The appellant had pleaded guilty to motor manslaughter, but contended his sentence of six years, nine months prison was manifestly excessive because the sentencing judge had failed to discount the otherwise appropriate sentence by 10% to reflect the appellant's Māori heritage and its associated social disadvantage. The appeal didn't succeed, but the application of the Canadian approach may well come again, and I will not therefore express any personal views. The issues arising from the Canadian authorities, though, are fundamental and important ones, bringing the tension between consistency and individualised uh, justice into sharp focus. Is this race-based sentencing and an affront to consistency and equality before the law? Or, correctly analysed, is it differentiating in order to equalise, to avoid gross injustice and to reduce disproportionate rates of imprisonment? What effect does it have on the interests of victims? Is this mandated by the Sentencing Act? And if not, is it in the policy realm outside the proper remit of a non-elected uh, judiciary? I leave those questions uh, for you to ponder. After the enactment of the uh, Sentencing Act, the Court of Appeal continued to issue tariff or guideline judgments as they became known. Since 1978, the guideline judgments have become increasingly sophisticated, evolving from the purely descriptive, i.e. setting ranges by reference to existing sentencing patterns, evolving from that to the prescriptive, actually making new norms. The judgments now typically identify aggravating features of the offence under review, and then uh, set out sentencing bans with a range of starting points uh, for each. Which band any particular case will slot into depends on the number and nature of the aggravating factors present. Take uh, band two, for example, starting point of five to 10, that's for offending that features two or three of the listed aggravating features. And those are extreme violence, premeditation, serious injury, use of a weapon, attacking the head, vulnerability of the victim, and multiple attackers. The judgments stress that the placing of any particular case within a band is an evaluative exercise, and that judges still enjoy a reasonable degree of latitude because at the margins, as you can see, the bands overlap. The issuing of guideline judgments has sometimes been in response to legislative change, a reclassification of a drug, say, or an increase in a maximum penalty, a response to changes in societal values or concerns about consistency in relation to a particular offence. Discerning the intention behind a legislative change isn't always straightforward. For example, in 2008, the Sentencing Act was amended to provide that in cases involving neglect or violence towards children, sentences must take into account various specified matters. The matters specified were all matters judges were already taking into account. So in one appeal I heard the appellant argued that it was wrong to infer any parliamentary message uh, to get tougher. Fortunately, we managed to avoid having uh, to decide that, but you can see it's an argument that um, was understandable. Consideration of uh, whether to issue a guidelines judgment is ongoing, and for example, last year, the Court of Appeal consulted with the profession as well as the district and high court judges to identify any areas that they thought might be suitable. Currently, the coverage of these guideline judgments is limited to serious crime, where the primary question is really the length of the prison term. Some commentators suggest that as a result of that limited coverage, 
there can still be quite significant disparity in lower level offending. In 2013, a research study found that whether you were sentenced in a metropolitan area or in the provinces significantly affected the chances of you going to prison in relation to burglary and drink driving. Dunedin was counted as a provincial area, and I regret to advise <laughs> that this appears to significantly affect the likelihood of a prison sentence in relation to those two offences, and in relation to burglary, the length of the prison term. This was so even when controlling for the core sentencing factors that judges need to weigh up in order to achieve individualised justice. Such findings have prompted calls in some quarters um, for the reactivation of the Sentencing Council Act of 2007. Now that act was a Labour Party initiative languished on the statute books since the national uh, government came into office. As you may recall, the act established a statutory body comprised of judges and experts tasked with the job of issuing presumptively binding sentencing guidelines in respect of all offences. Last month, the government announced that this Act, however, is one of 120 redundant statutes uh, to be repealed next year. The pros and cons of having a sentencing council have been extensively debated elsewhere, and I have no useful new insights to add other than to note that a recent critique of the English Sentencing Council by a man who was largely instrumental um, in its establishment, Professor Ashworth um, suggests that the sentencing council there has not met all expectations. On the other hand, also just last month, Scotland launched its brand new sentencing council. Its chief aims are said to be to tackle the problem of inconsistent sentencing and to raise public awareness and understanding of sentencing practice. In addition to issuing guideline judgments, the Court of Appeal has also mandated in reliance on the Sentencing Act, a more structured approach to sentencing. In Tawiki, the Court of Appeal held that in every case, sentences are, sentencing judges are required to follow a two-stage approach. In the first stage, the judge must identify a starting point sentence that reflects the inherent seriousness of the offence. If there's an applicable guidelines judgment, then the task is simply to slot the case into the right band. Otherwise, the judge may have to look at a series of other decisions. Once the appropriate starting point is identified, then you go on to the second stage, which is to individualise the sentence by adjusting the starting point upwards or downwards by reference to mitigating and aggravating factors personal to the individual, such as have they got a record, are they remorseful, have they pleaded guilty, before arriving at an end sentence. Following this methodology forces the sentencer to quantify the various discounts and increases. The combined effect of the guidelines judgment, the bans, and the two-stage approach has been said to strike a balance between consistency and individualised justice. Critics of the two-stage approach include, rather surprisingly, judges of the High Court of Australia they contend it reduces sentencing to a mathematical exercise and is wrong in principle. Justice McHugh has been particularly scathing, describing the two-stage approach as pseudoscience and belief in it a fairy tale. There is, he graphically observed, no Aladdin's cave of accurate sentencing methodology, the door to which can be opened by chanting the magic words, two-tier sentencing. The High Court of Australia, or at least the majority of them, uh, prefer an approach known as instinctive synthesis. <laughs> <laughs> Under this approach, the sentencing judge must still identify all the relevant factors, but rather than ascribe weighting to them, simply arrives at an end sentence that represents the judge's intuitive synthesis of them all. Critics of the two-stage approach also contend it makes sentencing a time-consuming exercise without a clear gain. Certainly, there is a dramatic contrast between the length of today's sentencing notes and those of yesteryear. One of my older colleagues told me as counsel he would commonly hear sentencings 
that went along the following lines. Blogs, no mister, blogs, you have been convicted of rape. You and I both know that is a serious offence. You and I both know 10 years imprisonment is the appropriate sentence, and you are sentenced accordingly. Stand down. <laughs> While some may yearn for those simpler days, I consider there is a clear gain to the two-stage approach in terms of transparency and also consistency because of the ability to compare one case meaningfully with another. That's not possible unless the culpability of the offending is assessed separately from the personal circumstances of the offender. Sentencing remains an evaluative process, although I have to confess, I did used to take my calculator into court and we have had the occasional appeal where the judge got the maths wrong. <laughs> that wasn't you, Judge Crosby. <laughs> <laughs> but the Court of Appeal has never subscribed to the view there's a single correct sentence, only a permissible range. And so long as the sentence is within range, how the judge got there will not usually warrant appellate intervention. As this plotted history demonstrates, the role of the judge in sentencing has changed dramatically since the 1950s. There is far greater emphasis on consistency and transparency. Sentencing hearings are longer, with victims also having the opportunity to be heard. While the sentencer retains discretion, the exercise of that discretion is regulated by legislation and by appellate review. Today, in the Court of Appeal, appeals against sentence account for over 50% of our criminal work, and in turn, the criminal works over 50% of the total work, civil and criminal. The further question is, in addition to legislation and appellate review, should sentencing discretion also be influenced by public opinion? Apart from dealing with the length of the non-parole period for murder, the Sentencing Act did not prescribe sentencing levels. However, it was the expectation of some politicians that the judges would get tougher. And so it proved. When the Sentencing Act was passed, our prison muster stood at 6,000. So that's 2002. By 2008, it was 8,000. And in terms of other law, common law countries and major Western nations, we were second only to the USA. Prison overcrowding became an issue. The latest figures as at December 2014 show that we appear to have maintained the silver medal with a victim of 190 per 100,000 or a total muster of 8,641. If the Sentencing Act didn't contain anything new, and if there was not a significant upsurge in crime, then based on those figures, there must be an argument that the major reason for the unprecedented increase in the prison population after 2002 was that the judiciary responded to popular demand. Certainly that was the view of one of our most experienced uh, criminal trial judges, Sir Graham Pankhurst, Speaking in 2008, he said that the referendum, the media focus on crime, the rhetoric of lobby groups and the political climate all combined to influence the judiciary to impose more severe sentences. Whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing is likely to depend on your view of uh, penal policy. Also, whether you think public opinion is well informed and also whether you consider as a matter of principle that sentencing judges should take public opinion into account or should they remain aloof and rely solely on Parliament to reflect public opinion through legislative change. Conversely, you might believe that rather than respond to public opinion, sentencing judges should attempt to lead it. Most people, I think, would agree that it would be totally wrong were judges to be swayed by popular clamour over a particular case, or appear to be swayed, which is why, in my view, it was so wrong for the New Zealand Herald to publish a poll canvassing readers' opinions about what sentence should be imposed on John Banks, 
uh, before the sentencing took place. Conversely, I think most people would agree that sentencing should reflect societal values, as indeed the Court of Appeal expressly stated was a reason for adjusting uh, the sentences for rape. And would also agree that it's appropriate that sentencing judges should take into account public concerns in their region about the prevalence of particular crimes. Arguing that courts must reflect legitimate public attitudes and concerns in sentencing offenders, uh, Justice Ted Thomas, in one case, contended that this was a necessary concomitant of the fact that it's the community that delegated, that has delegated the sentencing function to judges. The community's norms and expert expectations must therefore be permitted to inform the sentencing process. He also pointed out that if sentences do not have general acceptance, then confidence in the administration of justice will diminish. Thirdly, he considered that lay people can and do make a valuable contribution. Standing outside the sentencing process, they are frequently able to discern shortcomings that may escape those involved in it. Similar sentiments were expressed in an Australian case by Justice McHugh when he said, judges are aware that if they consistently impose sentences that are either too lenient or too severe, they risk undermining public confidence in the administration of justice and invite legislative interference in the exercise of judicial discretion, which it might be said is exactly what happened in this country in 2002. The irony, however, is of course that 13 years later, although crime rates are reducing and our rates of incarceration high, the image of the out-of-touch latte liberal persists in the public imagination. This was starkly illustrated this year by the outcry over a judge's decision not to impose preventive detention on a young offender who later went on to commit a most horrific murder of um, Mrs. Blessie Katinko. There were calls um, in some quarters from the media for the judge in question to be held accountable, like everyone else, and even to be sacked for making a wrong decision. It appears many of these critics do not believe judges should act on evidence or they could not have troubled themselves to read the sentencing notes because had they done so, they would have realised that the independent medical evidence about risk was ambivalent with a psychiatrist advising that the offender was actually at low risk of re-offending. But never let an inconvenient detail get in the way of a good story. Even a respected senior journalist like Duncan Garner, writing an opinion piece in the mainstream media, had this to say about the case. I'd like to see judges held to account for their decisions. I want to hear them talk openly and publicly about the verdicts they deliver and why. Surely the power to take away someone's liberty should come with some semblance of accountability, yet judges have always hidden away behind high office and protocols. The reality is our justice system has been broken for too long. Obviously court decisions should not be immune from public criticism, but with respect these comments are simply ill-informed. They overlook that in cases of serious crime judges do explain in depth the reasons for their sentences, both orally in the highly public forum of the court and in detailed written sentencing notes which are also publicly available. Judges are accountable because their work is so public and, of course, there is appellate review. Significantly, too, there's no mention in the article of the Sentencing Act and its provisions relating to preventive detention, creating the misleading impression that the judge had open-ended discretion. It might also be rather tartly suggested that if the writer were to experience living in a country where the rule of law does not prevail, then he might really know what a broken justice system looks like. This opinion piece attracted a lot of comment on stuff, comments such as, we pay these judges very generous salaries to protect us from filth, and they fail us time and time again. The calls for proper sentencing began decades ago. We even gave them a clear mandate in a referendum, and still they ignore us. 
And it's obvious to most of us that our judicial system is now failing the victims of crime on a regular basis. Our judges are so far removed from the real world that we all live in. They may be lawyers but lack any form of common sense and continually side with the offenders in court. The whole judicial system is failing its people in New Zealand and needs to be radically changed. Should judges just take this sort of thing on the chin and accept it goes with the territory? If it were only an issue of wounded pride and annoyance, then yeah, maybe. However, the problem is that these sorts of attacks are actually quite corrosive and can undermine public confidence in the administration of justice. If you say something often enough, people start to believe it. The legitimacy of the criminal justice system has been said to hinge on public confidence. Maintaining it is therefore essential. In some ways, as pointed out by an Australian judge, the problem has got worse because of the phenomenon of social media and the reporting of court proceedings by those not subject to any ethical constraints as professional journalists. If you think about it, when was the last time you read an in-depth discussion of the reasons for a sentence as opposed to the reaction, often adverse, uh, to it? What then, if anything, can be done? Enhancing public understanding and knowledge of sentencing seems pivotal. One New Zealand survey in 2003, for example, showed a strong correlation between support for tougher penalties and a lack of knowledge about existing penalties and crime rates. Further, according to some, over-reporting of sensational crime has so imprinted itself on the public consciousness that although, like the rest of the Western world, we have a falling crime rate, few really believe it. There are also fundamental misconceptions about the nature of a criminal prosecution. For example, the erroneous belief that the prosecution is brought on behalf of the victim um, rather than the state. Conversely, when people are better informed, the surveys paint a very different picture. An Australian survey of jurors showed that 90% of jurors surveyed at the end of their respective trials thought the sentence imposed by the judge was appropriate and ironically, in fact, a majority of them would have personally proposed a more lenient sentence. In recent years, concerted judicial efforts have been made to dis demystify sentencing in New Zealand by making decisions more transparent and also by making them more readily available to the public. High Court sentencing notes are routinely put online. The Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal issue press releases about judgments and the courts have even recently opened a Twitter account. Although that is not without its critics, a similar suggestion in Australia drawing the comment from a senior judge that it's not the function of the courts to market their judgments with racy teasers. <laughs> Traditionally, in the face of unjustified personal attacks, judges have let their decisions speak for themselves and remained out of the fray. But if the decisions are not being read, can the judiciary really just afford to sit back, to maintain a dignified silence and hope the Law Society or the Attorney General will say something, or rely on the off chance that a well-informed individual like Jonathan Eaton will feel moved to write, as he did, an excellent letter to the editor in defence of the judge? I ask this question, in the age of the internet, has the time come for the judiciary to push back and to engage more? Or would that risk undermining the appearance of impartiality? I don't really know the answer to that question, but in my view, it is a debate uh, worth having, along with the continuing debate about the need for proper civics courses in schools. As stated at the beginning of this address, uh, sentencing is a challenging and difficult task. I hope this address has highlighted some of those difficulties with a view to better understanding the role of the judge in sentencing. That way, legitimate public opinion, to which in my view judges should be responsive, will be well informed.
Section 3 of the Sentencing Act provides that one of the key purposes of the Act is to aid in the public's understanding of sentencing practices. That aim does not yet appear uh, to have been fully realised. There is definitely more work uh, to be done. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Kimberly Jarvis and I'm the Deputy Convener of OWLS this year. Um, it is my job to thank Her Honour for her engaging address. I can't help but think that perhaps some of the people who were commenting on stuff.co.nz about the decisions would greatly have benefited from hearing this address in advance. Sentencing always seems to have been a bit of a spectator sport. The difference of course now is that instead of attending your local court to hear the whole process play out, you now see the highlights on TV. It's all too easy for all of us to get caught up in a sentencing soundbite whereby we hear three minutes of the process on TV, elevate ourselves to the bench and feel qualified to give our two cents worth on the result. This of course is why we all, and particularly those of us who are in the legal profession, uh, have a responsibility to stick up for the sentencing proce process itself uh, when these sorts of things arrive. Uh, I encourage you all to do so in future. I would like to present Her Honour with a token of our appreciation uh, for her insightful and timely reminder of the importance of understanding the sentencing process. Um, would you please join me all in thanking Her Honour. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, uh, the New Zealand Law Foundation, the Otago University Faculty of Law and the Williams Trust. Uh, without the support, uh, we could not host this address. So I would like you all to have a thank you for that as well, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce a trustee of our main sponsor, the New Zealand Law Foundation, Professor Peter Skegg, who will address you. As a trustee of the Law Foundation, my task this afternoon is twofold. The first is to join in expressing thanks to Justice French for this afternoon's lecture. I had heard glowing reports of Christine French before I first met her a third of a century ago on the other side of the world. I was impressed then, and everything I've observed since has con confirmed the accuracy of the reports that had preceded her. I recall various people, many of them New Zealanders, being amazed, even appalled, that she intended to return to Invercargill when she'd finished her studies at Oxford. Uh, what a waste, they thought, <laughs> and how wrong they were. Justice French's teachers at the Otago Law Faculty already had high expectations for her and they have not been disappointed. It's been a joy for them, as for many of us, to see her virtues and abilities recognised ever more widely in the New Zealand legal community. Although hers is now a national role, the southern legal community will always take a particular pride in Justice French and her achievements. Many of you will remember the bar dinner held in her honour at the Dunedin Club a few years ago. Never had I been to a law function where there was such unqualified admiration and affection for the person being honoured. Today's lecture has simply renewed those sentiments for many of us. As most of you will realise, a, an address like that which... Justice French has provided for us today requires an immense amount of thought and simple hard grind in preparation. So thank you, Justice French, for today's uh, thoughtful and uh, informative uh, and superbly presented address. Now I started by saying I had two tasks, and the second one is what is now standing 
between you and refreshments. <laughs> uh, this is to say something about the New Zealand Law Foundation, which has long assisted in the funding of this lecture, as also in the scholarship, which bears the name of Ethel Benjamin. As Justice French, as you've heard, as a former trustee of the foundation, she at least may be tolerant of my speaking for a few minutes about the foundation. In its present form, the Law Foundation dates from the early 1990s, but its regular funding source came to an end in 2008. Uh, alternative sources of funding have proved uh, very difficult to come by, so the Foundation is likely to be faced with the choice of continuing its current levels of functioning and funding uh, through perhaps to the middle of the next decade, or else on cutting back on that funding quite substantially so that it can continue on a much lesser scale for longer. But for the time being at least, the Foundation funds a very wide range of research and other activities that seem to the trustees to be worthwhile, uh, with little or no regard for its effect on the Foundation's capital reserve, which have now reduced to about $16 million. Now, as would be expected, much of that funding goes to legal research uh, carried out by university-based academics. But I'm by no means alone in particularly welcoming applications for funding from practicing members of the profession to help them build on their areas of experience and expertise to produce work for the benefit of the wider community. And currently, Alison Douglas and Warren Forster are two local lawyers who were prominent on the list of practitioners whom the Foundation is assisting in research related to their areas of expertise. In the past couple of years, more than a million dollars has been allocated by the Law Foundation to help fund Otago-based research. In fairness to Alison and Warren, it should be explained that they are by no means the, the main uh, beneficiaries of this funding. Much is going well, to the Donald Beasley Institute, for example, and to the university's Legal Issues Centre. It's also appropriate to acknowledge the Foundation's continuing funding support of NZ Lee, much the largest online provider of legal information in this country. Perhaps it's also appropriate to mention that it was Donna Buckingham, Justice French's friend and law faculty contemporary, who's played a key part in the development of NZ Lee. Now, the director of the Law Foundation, Linda Hagen, is with us this afternoon, and she and I would gladly talk to anyone who wanted to explore the possibility of Law Foundation funding for law-related projects that are likely to benefit the wider legal or other community. Uh, I was going to say, and I eliminate it, but I now put it back, that a wealth of information is available on the Foundation's website. Uh, I looked at it today and couldn't find it. However, I, uh, and Linda tells me the website's down today, but if you look next week, there's a great idea about our criteria and the enormous range of things that have been funded. All that said, it simply remains for me to repeat our thanks to Justice French and to ask you to join with me in re-expressing our gratitude for that memorable lecture.